right. It's fine. So, shall we start? Yeah. Okay, so my name is Linda Wisniewski. Uh, I'm a NetJSD developer. I have been a developer since 2006, 2007, nearly 2007, generally. Um, so, for some time, I have been working on various different areas of NetBSD, so a uh, thread scheduler, virtual memory subsystem, um, and various POSIX extensions like POSIX, POSIX message queues. And generally, I'm focusing on scalability and performance issues in NetBSD, so trying to make NetBSD faster and more scalable. Uh, professionally, I work on database distributed systems. Uh, I live in London, um, and again, I I focus in in commercial in, in the industry on scalability and performance issues on the systems, which run on Unix, all sorts of Unix flavors. So, scalability and performance is yeah one of my areas I'm really interested in. So let's start. Um, a presentation about NPF. NPF is um, a business packet filter. It was um, added in 2010, 9-ish, something like that. So it can do TCP IP traffic filtering, stateful inspection, and NAT, obviously. So traditional features uh, packet filters have. And what was the motivation for a new packet filter in NetBSD? Well, there are a couple of things. First is multi-core multi world. So basically, there was no SMB-optimized packet filter in BSD land back, back at that time. So that was one key motivation. Uh, another motivation, um, I wasn't particularly satisfied with existing code bases like PF or IP filter. Uh, so I decided to you know, design this thing from scratch because you can do that. <laughs> um, NPF was also some um, well, indirect, partly response to NF Tables project launched by Linux Netfilter project. So uh, NF Tables was kind of a prototype new project written by Linux guys to make a uh, core uh, completely lossless. So again, uh, Linux guys created NF Tables uh, in order to make uh, filtering scalable. So they were concerned about scaling as well. So NPF was partly a response to that project. Um, another motivation is um, vendors and users sometimes need custom solutions, well, often need custom solutions. And existing packet filters do not have a good infrastructure and API to create extensions. So, you know, think of plugins or some sort of proprietary components you want to attach the packet filter and do something with it. So, NPF uh, addresses this, it provides a convenient API for extensions. And we will cover that later. So, yeah, another issue. You know, uh, NPF is BSD license, so it's not GPL, and GPL is sometimes an issue. And while Netfilter, for example, has great infrastructure for extensions, good, extent, good infrastructure, uh, GPL can be an issue, and there are some known uh, suitcases. So, NPF. As I mentioned, written from scratch with a focus on performance, scalability, and modularity. So it supports um, simple filtering, NAT, uh, as I mentioned, extensions, uh, protocol independence in an NPF core engine. Uh, I'll cover this a little bit later. It also supports tables, so storage, storage design for large IP sets and frequent updates. Um, it's PSD license. And it has IPv6 support and a couple extensions like extension for normalization, logging, uh, random traffic, uh, dropping to generate lost packets, as packets, for example. And you can add whatever you want, really. So let's start with the design. Um, and I'll start with the packet classification engine. So you know, how, how exactly NPF processes packets? Well, it uses BPF for this purpose. So it uses bytecode. Uh, but it also uses JIT compilation. So why why there was a decision to use bytecode? Well, it provides protocol independence. It means that if you want to filter some particular uh, protocol, for example, or some pattern, you do not need any kernel modifications. 
you can write some sort of you know byte code um, in the user line and just feed that to the kernel. So it gives a lot of freedom to you know support different uh, filtering patterns. So that's very flexible and very convenient. Um, we use SLJIT, which is Stackless JIT Compiler, uh, to basically compile DPF bytecode into you know, machine code. Um, SLJIT is also used by PCRE Rex library. So it's reasonably tested and benchmarked. It also supports multiple architectures. So that's, that's quite convenient. Um, there is a little problem. Well, there was a little problem. DPF instruction set is quite, well, not limited, but it has one limitation that you can't do complex operations. So for example, for example you cannot uh, do a table lookup. So that's something we needed to address. And BPF was extended with coprocessor support to offload complex operations. So coprocessor is, think of you know, MIPS coprocessor or you know, a coprocessor in other RISC uh, architecture. So it honors the tradition of RISC-like instruction sets that you can call an instruction which will do something more complicated. So two new instructions were added to BPF MISC category, uh, which is BPF COP and COP X, register X. So you can, basically kernel subsystem can preload uh, a bunch of functions, and you can call those functions. Uh, I have to stress that those are predetermined functions. It's not something you, you pass from user land, so it's completely kernel subsystem's responsibility to do that. And you can pull those um, functions from the DBI bytecode. So basically, you can add any complex uh, packet processing capabilities um, to this DBI bytecode program. And that's very convenient. The one thing to mention um, yeah, uh, DBF coprocessors, coprocessors can read the packet in read only manner. Uh, Basically, use MemStore just to get some some uh, values and to, to to return some values. It cannot change the flow, so BPF uh, programs uh, do not become Turing complete because BPF bytecode is not Turing complete. It can go only forwards, it can't go backwards, which makes this thing not Turing complete. So, yeah, it doesn't increase the complexity of BPF bytecode itself in the sense that you know we can still uh, reason about it. And make sure it's safe. So, one cool thing about um, using BPF, NPF, is that there's also support for a PCAP filter. So basically, I can use PCAP library to well formulate my filter criteria. And as you might know, basically PCAP is just the same thing TCP dump uses. So you can do a byte code, sorry, a byte level uh, filtering. For example, you can say, you know, give me a header, header and look at those bytes. And, you know, you can shift, you can do and or whatever operations. So you can specify virtually any pattern you want. If you will do man pcap dash filter, you will see that, you know, you have all these uh, low level instructions. And that allows you to create any bytecode program you want. So that, that is very, very powerful. And as I mentioned, no need for kernel change to, to do that in user land. Um, by the way, unifying all packet classification engines under BPF is not a new idea. That was something discussed decades ago that you know we can use LQ, all packet filters, uh, IPsec, you know anything what does some sort of uh, filtering matching. You know, we need some sort of rules. Uh, all those could use BPF. So th th this is an old idea. It's just nobody's for some reason adopted it. Um, Let's move on. So, rules in NPF. There are static and dynamic rules. Uh, static rules are like in uh, PF or IP filter when you have npf.com and you, you just load, load the whole thing. Now, dynamic rules are more like uh, IP tables. So, you can add the rules on the fly. So, you have a static rule set. Um, in that rule set, you can define a group or you know some sort of keyword. And, as mentioned here, um, rules can be nested. So you can have as many you know, nested rules as you want. There's artificial limit just to you know, not overflow anything. Um, but yes, so in the static rules that you just define um, a point, label point with some name, and you can add dynamic rules on the fly there. Now, rules and reload uh, 
is formed as one single copy. So <coughs> it prepares the new rule set, and once it's prepared, it basically swaps a couple of pointers, and uh, that's more or less lockless. Uh, there is one lock just to make sure that you don't, you know, run multiple re reloads at the same time, but, well, that's quite silly to do. So, it's just preserving consistency, but the point is that rule set reload doesn't affect the processing of packets. So when you do reload, it's very efficient. You just swap the old with the new. So you do the old. And for this, we use passive serialization. So passive serialization is similar concept to RCU, uh, read, copy, update in Linux, except it's a little bit older and patent-free. Um, so this allows us to do, well, lockless processing of the rule set. And uh, passive serialization works in the same way by having a grace period. So on the writer side, on the reload side, you just need to make sure that there are no uh, <coughs> readers running uh, after some time. So, I won't go into the details how passive serialization works. If, if you want to know, I can explain it offline. Um, so, let's carry on. Dynamic rules. Uh, dynamic rules, um, as I mentioned, they work in a very similar way, like you know, IP tables, so you just add them on the fly. There are a um, couple of ways, you know, how can we identify those rules. One way is when you, we add a rule, and we have to return a unique ID for you. So, if you will later want to remove that rule, you can say, you know, remove this ID. That unique ID is just a 64-bit number. Uh, it's unique, well, it's fine. Other way, you can specify the same filter pattern, and uh, SHA-1 hash is computed on the metadata, so basically on that rule, and if you will specify, you know, if you will attempt to remove the rule which has the same filter pattern, it will detect by the hash. So, I'd be recommended, but sometimes you can't do that. So if you just write a unique shell script, it sometimes might be convenient to just write the full pattern. So that's just a glimpse how how the dynamic rules work. So as I mentioned, you just create some test set, which is just keyword in your static rule set, and you just you know add your rules. You can list them, you can flush them, you can remove them. Um, let's move on. Stateful inspection. So NPF supports um, stateful filtering. It supports full tra tracking of TCP connections. So there was an old paper, I think, 2001, by Luigi Van Fudo, if I pronounced his name correctly, previous developer. Um, so it performs full TCP driving, TCP state, sequence numbers, window, um, and that is supported by NPF. It's it's kind of standard way to to do state state tracking in pretty much all packet filters. So PF, IP filter, uh, Linux uh, net filter contract um, extension does this the same thing. So bit about implementation. Tracked, uh, tracked connections are stored in, um, well, hashed red black trees. Now, why we have this kind of double data structure? Well, hash uh, allows us to distribute the logs, so we reduce the log retention. Because um, even though we use read write logs, there are still FX, um, cache effects, which I'll cover just in the next slide. Uh, while, why we need a tree? Well, tree prevents from um, uh, denial of service, service attacks by exploiting hash collisions. So we, we don't have ON behavior if we use lists you know, in, in a hash table. So it gives us log N behavior. So that's kind of important. Um, one other thing, in NPF, a uh, state is uniquely identified by a 6 tuple uh, source address, source and destination address and port. A protocol number and interface ID. So, interface ID is kind of important because uh, if you have multiple interfaces, somebody on other interface can send a spoof packet and you know, temporarily create a, a connection which will be globally visible amongst all your interfaces. I believe that's a default behavior in FreeBSD's IP FW. Um, that, that might not necessarily be a desirable behavior and my, it was my deliberate decision to, to do a 6 tuple lookup, basically include the interface address. However, there are legitimate cases when bypassing you know, um, the rule set on other interfaces is perfectly fine, i.e. safe, and it obviously can you know, increase performance because you, you don't inspect the rule set. So, 
Uh, I added stateful ends keyword, which basically says, which basically works as 5 2 lookup. So it basically says this state is valid for on all interfaces. So you know it will pick up this state on other interfaces if it was created with stateful end ends keyword. Uh, so it's up to administrator whether he, he wants to use, he or she wants to use stateful or stateful ends. So basically, whether you want to use 6 tuple or 5 tuple code. Per interface or low, up to you. The current uh, performance of state lookup is good enough, but not optimal. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we use hashed trees, and trees are protected by read byte lock. And as everybody knows, read byte locks uh, suffer from cache line balancing effect. Basically, on the reader side, you still increment the, the reference count, saying that, you know, I'm a reader, I came, and when you exit, you do decrement it. So that uh, constantly gets the cache line dirty and you have extra traffic between CPUs. So that doesn't exactly scale. Um, hashing out these locks uh, helps. And you will see later that it's good enough, but not in the long term. So the current work I'm, I'm doing is to basically replace this hashed trees way of doing things with just a better data structure. And I'm currently working on a lockless cache word B plus tree. Um, there's a footnote. Uh, it's a mass tree uh, written, well, designed by some guys at Mitten Harvard. Um, so some preliminary results indicate that state lookup will be twice faster, potentially more, because it didn't finish all the optimizations. And it scales linearly, because the you know, lookup path is pretty much lockless. There are cases when it restarts when you split the nodes, but splits do not have do not happen so often in D3, which has a reasonable panel. So move on. Uh, NPF supports dynamic and static NAT. NAT basically it means stateful and stateless. So you can do source or destination NAT, so basically inbound outbound if you like IETF terms. It can do address port translation or it can do just port translation. Into the directional NAT, which is just a combination of two rules, nothing more than that. Um, so pretty much any variations can be defined using a single expressive form of syntax, which you see here. It's just the mapping of two segments on the left right hand side and the right hand side. And arrow indicates uh, you know, what you want to rewrite, source or destination or both. And uh, yes, the, the size of those network segments just means whether it's symmetric or asymmetric whether you're translating a network to a single address or a network to a network. So with this index, you can define almost anything you want. Um, recently, NPF also gained support for IPv6 network prefix translation. So NPTV version 6 is just a static, I mean stateless NAT with a particular algorithm specified. So again, it's a symmetric mapping. Let's say you have slash 48. So you have, this is a better action with that. Uh, so, the only thing you do is, when you find static NAT, you just specify the algorithm. Because you need to say, in packet filter, if I map these networks, well, what algorithm to use to map these you know, hosts onto different networks? So, the cool thing about NPT version 6 is that, um, well, obviously, the thing is it's stateless, but it also rewrites the prefixes in a way which doesn't require a uh, checksum up update. So it has this clever uh, once complement arithmetics to avoid checksum updates, which is very, very efficient. It's just you know, pure, simple algorithm. Tables, so as I mentioned, uh, NPF supports uh, tables for large IP sets. And it's kind of similar to IP set module in Linux NetFilter or um, PF tables. So there are three types. There is a hash. It provides amortized O1 lookup. Amortized because you obviously have, can have hash collisions. So if you have a growing set, well, that's not great because eventually you will get collisions and you, know, you will end up doing OM lookups. Um, but it's lockless because the hash itself, you know, we can look at it loglessly and we can loglessly modify the link lists. So if you have, you know, kind of static but sometimes changing set of IP addresses, hash is reasonably good. Um, the second type is tree. We're currently using, using Patricia tree. Uh, that's a prefix tree. 
So it provides OK lookup by K, I mean K key length. Um, and it's, it's potentially more suitable for dynamic sense, you know, which, which constantly change, but also because it's prefix tree, you can define not a bunch of hosts, but you can define networks. You can say, you know, I want to match slash 8 or slash 16 or whatever. <coughs> so that's a useful feature. The, the side note is um, the, well, the deficiency is that it uses read by clocks. And as we know, they, they suck. <laughs> so the, the future work is to implement some sort of clockless prefix tree, which is actually not too difficult. Um, and the third type is CDB. It's a constant database which uses perfect hashing. So it guarantees a one lookup time, and it's basically lockless lookup. You don't need lock blocks whatsoever, because you gen generate it once, and you, and you can reload it uh, using passive serialization. So if you have you know, a set which very rarely changes, this is practically ideal. I don't think you can do you know, much better than that. Permutation, if you have a particular set. Um, let's move on. So modularity. NPF is module. Uh, each component is abstract, abstracted using its strict interface. I have, let's say, say tool inspection, inspection module, I have NAP module, and so on. So I hope the code is quite easy to read and understand and see where the boundaries are moving, what, what little subsystem within NPF is doing. And as I mentioned before, uh, extensions. So we have rule procedures in NPF. It's basically you can define a particular procedure for this rule. So rule procedure is just uh, you can associate some you know load some module and associate some functionality with the rule. So you can write rule procedures yourself, and it, it just contains two parts: uh, SO file, which is just a simple library, and kernel module. To so write those down, uh, you drop in the SO file, just library, and library, and PFCTL will pick it up and will know that you know, I support this extra extending of the syntax some parameters, and it will feed to the kernel, and the kernel module will, will understand you know, what was fitted. And about 160 lines, including the license and the comments, is to you know, create a simple demo extension which blocks arbitrary uh, percentage of traffic, so you know, just to simulate uh, uh, some lost packets. And you don't need to make any change to the core NPF. So you can have a kernel, write these two things, load, <coughs> on you know already running system and that's it, it just works. So for third parties, you know, for customers, vendors, users as well, I think that is very, very convenient. And that was the intention of, of you know why I created these rule procedures to make it simple. Yep. Can you have multiple rule procedures uh, per rule? Yeah, sure. You can have as many as you want. So basically when you create a rule, you um, create a rule procedure which you associate with the rule. And within the rule procedure, you specify all the extensions I want to invoke. And in key value pairs, you, you know, pass the parameters. And you can you know, invoke as many extensions as you want. So it's a bit double wrapping, if you see what I mean. But the point is that you, know, you can support as many, as many extensions, do as many ex extensions and you know, operations within, associated with a single rule as you want. Let's move on. Testing. So for testing, NPF uses um, RUMP. RUMP is Runnable User Space Metal Programs. Uh, it basically allows us to run kernel, NPF kernel, as a regular program. So it's just a simple binary you run, and you know you can do whatever you want. In GDB, you can k trace it. You can. It's just a program. And. Uh, the cool thing is that you can run that program, basically compiling BSD kernel, and run not only on NetBSD, but you can run it on Linux, Solaris, FreeBSD, whatever. Um, we don't get support for SX, I'm kind of preparing patches for this, but you can run NetBSD kernels on other systems as well, and use other tools which are available there. Wildgrind, Dtrace, but we have Dtrace in NetBSD, uh, anything we want. Um, you can also run TCP stat of NetBSD as a regular program. You can, you know, make that device and pass all the traffic to it. Um, so yeah, this makes debugging and profiling, testing and everything just way more easier because, well, there will be another slide. But just to mention, NPF has regressions and they're integrated in NPF's test testing so you constantly run. And if you change something and you break something, you will get an email soon. 
So there are unit tests for every NPF subsystem. They are available within NPF test programs. So there's just a little test uh, program I wrote so you can say, okay, I want to test NAT. And you say NAT, there we go, run the test. Um, very convenient. But the, you can also TCP dump some traffic and just pass to the NPF test and see how it beha behaves. So for example, uh, when I was de developing a uh, stateful inspection, well, you, you know, somebody has a trouble, so I just ask for PCAP file, the guy sends me a PCAP file, I pick this and see how exactly state changed. You, know, you can write some little tool to visualize it even if you want, or when TCP window changed. So it's really, really convenient. Um, yeah, obviously, you have some other tools, like, like you know, show the bytecode, show the existing rule, uh, rule set, uh, configuration, whatever, uh, in raw format. All that is available in user space. So another cool thing is that um, NPF get, has recently gained support for Runcron project. Um, Runcron is just a wrapper around uh, that build run framework I mentioned before. So apart from you know just running the binary, it also provides lots of tools. So it can spawn um, instances of NetBSD kernels, like, like it would be servers, hosts, and config with them. You know, you run a program, and you can say, if config, this run kernel. So what does that mean? It means that you can write a little shell script, like 50 lines, spawn a bunch of nodes, basically run kernels, create a network amongst them, and you know, let's say decide, oh, that node will, you know, or let's say create two networks, and that node will be NPF, and test NAT between the programs which are running. So I think that's that's pretty cool because you know all this can be scripted very very quickly, and all those run kernels and you know, with the traffic amongst them just runs in a second because you know it's not a big virtualization thing where you have to boot something, configure something, it's all done in a single script with a regular program, one second done. So we can test trace route this way and you see you know how 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 trace route basically UDP and you know uh, coming back, I think the packets flow between those programs. Um, so yeah again, cool to play. Uh, now there's a link how to do that and there's actually how to um, tutorial how to set up a little uh, RAM server with an NPF enabled there and how to you know configure NPF there. So um, I mentioned that one of the things is NPF is uh, with scalability and performance. So can we demonstrate it? And here's a nice plot. So that's on 12 core machine, um, each having two hardware threads, so 24 threads, uh, into the on whatever, two, two gigahertz. And the green line is rule set inspection, the blue line is stateful inspection. So as you see, rule set inspection is practically linear because uh, as I mentioned, it's lossless. So um, it goes, it de degrades a little bit at around 12 cores, which is normal. It's because of CPU topology, because this is 24 thread machine, so threads get contended, you know, within the core after 12 cores. We just need to reach that point of this particular hardware ar architecture. So yeah, it's linear scaling up to, up to 12 cores, and I believe way more. Uh, stateful inspection, as I mentioned, it uses read write blocks, so those are not great. And it's very visible here that it scales fine, it's up, it's fine up to eight cores, uh, and then it starts degrading and um, degrading significantly, but it still grows up to, let's say, 32. So it's still scaling up to 32, which is, I think, good. But as I mentioned, good enough. We can basically reach the same linear scalability with stateful inspection once I finish my uh, implementation of that B plus B plus B plus B plus B. So, yeah, we're very close to linear scalability both with rule set inspection and state inspection. Future directions. Um, yeah, porting to FreeBSD and the Lumos is under consideration. Um, there is some interest. Um, perhaps we might work you know, together with some developers. Um, I went to have high availability and load bal balancing at some point. Uh, quality of service, obviously, so rate limiting and traffic shaping. We might uh, integrate this with Alcu, but then again, it's currently kernel locked in at BSD and 
perhaps we can just implement something a bit more efficient and easier to contribute <coughs> than the current LT framework. Uh, obviously, more extensions. You know, we can have as many extensions as we want. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we can add interesting things there. And uh, please check the documentation. There's a page about NPF, you know, covering how to configure it, covering, you know, what has been in these slides. So there's a bit of information, and if you have any questions or, you know, comments about the documentation or in general, just email me. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this page up to date. And um, that's it. Any questions? Yep. yep. Do you have any numbers on absolute performance? Absolute in a sense of... Like uh, 50... Half a million packets per second, one million packets per second. Um, a, not, not on hand, not on hand. But uh, shouldn't be difficult to call that. I'm planning to um, do more extensive benchmarking of NPF and some comparison with you know other packet filters like PF and IP filter, and that would be both for multi-core, both for single uh, core scalability and performance. And uh, yeah, at some point I will publish all these graphs which will be much more detailed, it's just I haven't had time yet to do that. What was in the y-axis in the previous graph? I couldn't see from here. Right, in the y-axis. Okay, this is truth book. This is million packets per second. Oh, okay, so that's the number But for. it's using RAM. Yeah, okay, but fine. Right, so you have, what, you have 25 millions uh, yeah. per second at full set inspection. Mm -hmm. But again, as I say, it's, it's using RAM, so it's not Absolutely. No, but it, it, it is a good number yeah. because uh, at least it's not uh, um, influenced by the low throughput of the interface. Right, yeah. So we basically kind of eliminate TCP uh, IP stack here because, you know, it, it, it might not be efficient. So here we just draw IPF performance. Uh, I'm the author of IPFW and Daminat. Just Say again? I'm the author of IPFW and Daminat. He was oh. laughing because... <laughs> cool. <laughs> And so, so another question, if you don't mind. Um, I know that you can use RAM to run everything in user space. Mm -hmm. Have you considered doing a standalone implementation of just the IPF in user space? I mean, I've, again, I've done something similar for IPFW. That, uh, um, well, okay, <laughs> define standalone. I mean, why, why do you need standalone? Because, uh, because, for instance, you can connect to NetMap or DPDK or some other... Uh, RUMP, RUMP already has, um, I think, I don't know what's the state of that support, but it already has some support for NetMap. Yeah, yeah, no, I did it with... <laughs> with <laughs> so you did it then, right? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> confuse me. So, um, no, but the, the thing is, uh, uh, RUMP is pretty big if you... Think right, so you just want to add, eliminate some overhead, some want, uh, emulation, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I think it wouldn't be hard because Actually, when I started writing NPF, I wrote many things in user land, and at that time I didn't use run. I wrote my you know, little yeah. testing.h, which was massive, <laughs> and it just runs as a you know regular program. And later I converted it to run. So I think making standalone NPF wouldn't be difficult. Uh, you know, you would just need to add a couple of wrappers for you know. Sure, sure. Uh, I was just wondering if you had yeah. it already working or not. No, I'm not because I think. Room is good enough to use, but if you mention that you know you're interested in this, then we might, yeah, I might work on this. Let's talk about it offline. Uh, one final question: you, sure. you spoke about the just-in-time compiler. Is mm -hmm. that something that uh, is large? I mean, uh, what if you wanted to run this on um, on an embedded system? Would you have uh, problems with the just-in-time compiler on that? Mm, no, I don't think so. I. I can't tell, <coughs> oh, we need to look up, we can look offline, you know, what's the size of SLJ, SLJ. Yeah. but the point of SLJ is that it's stackless compiler, so it's not like, you know, LLVM C language does, you know, this big uh, in intermediate representation tree and so on. So because it's stackless, it's very, very simple and quite small, it's, it's basically designed to translate, you know, bytecode and, you know, kind of different instruction set to machine code instruction set. So I think it would be fine for embedded systems. As I mentioned, it, it, it runs with PCRE library, so it's pretty small. Uh, what is the uh, differences, what are the main differences in the uh, instruction sets between, uh, say, uh, MPF and MPF? You have, uh, are you doing, are you doing, uh, are you able to map similar kinds of uh, instructions? Uh, what do you mean by instruction? Well, I guess rule, rule, 
right. rule types. Rule types. Um, So, you have this generic, you know, filtering pattern like TCP from to and so on, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a couple extra options. Um, but as I mentioned, you can have PCAP dash filter, and it gives you TCP dumps index. You can define whatever you want there. So I think it gives you know the maximum flexibility in terms of what kind of different tools you want to support, because you can you know just do many TCP dump and use that if you find something missing in standalone MPF. And it, it uses the same, you know, UPF bytecode. So there are no efficiency difference in between this kind of syntax and that PCAP filter uh, extension, which was somewhere uh, here. So just PCAP filter and you do DST and whatever you want. So th does that answer your question? Yeah, and uh, table support, you, you, do, you do have table support. Yeah, yeah, the, there was a slide. Um, yeah. uh, here. So this thing, you 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 manipulate tables in a, in a similar way like those dynamic rule sets. So you say you know NPFCTL uh, table some ID add this IP to that table and it just adds on the fly. So I I believe that that works the same way like uh, you know PF tables and and uh, Linux IP set. There are no support for uh, yet for addresses and ports. So if you want to do both, uh, currently you can't do that. I support only addresses. But I plan to, you know, add extensions. So you could do from table, and in that table you would have both addresses and ports, if you want. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Yep. Yeah. HA firewalls are actually really important for me for production systems, mm -hmm. and you probably know PF has a PF thing. In your design, uh, when you first uh, started out, did you think about high available firewalls clustering them? And um, what problems do you find? Do you think uh, you'll have when you actually work with highly available clustering firewalls? <laughs> well, that's a very, very wide question. Um, there are some plans to do. I have definitely plan to do this. Um, initially, it will be you know state replication. Um, the problem is that you kind of reach, um, you write a distributed system at this point. So, efficient distributed systems are you know, not that easy because, because you have this consistency problem. You have this cap theory, uh, consistency of availability and partitioning. So, um, there will be, I will need to you know, design something in terms of this, how exactly we want to handle those, those failure cases. And what kind of algorithms we're going to use you know, to maintain some uh, firewalls, you know, the state between them in sync. So, th does that answer your question? I mean, the, it's really just writing in this, a distributed system, and there's already lots of material. You know, how how can you handle uh, distributed system problems in you know different ways? So there are different protocols to maintain state. It's a raft protocol. No, if if you have a bunch of nodes there and a bunch of those there, there, and you have a partition, now there's a protocol how to how they decide what is the leader, and when that partition ends, and all those nodes can communicate again, you know how they relay the leader again and how they re-replicate the, the state. So I don't think the technical difficulty will be in implementing something simple like you know the state replication between two nodes. It's just you know a simple serialization. Uh, problem. So you just write down a bunch of states in some sort of form, format. You serialize them. You send them over the wire. Hopefully, that wire will be you know some, some sort of protected communication channel, public to everyone. Uh, but yes, I think the main difficulty will be deciding how to maintain the state consistency. But as I mentioned, it's it's a distributed system problem, and there's lots of material in this and uh, protocols. And I'm thinking, as I mentioned, to do something, like, let's say, like craft and, you know, approach it in this way. Cap theorem. That's the best way to reason about this system. And, and uh, just curious, how much of the PF code base did you use? Or None. Really? It's absolutely from, written from scratch. Wow. Any questions? <laughs> Yes, 
that's it. Thank you very much.